just a little slow. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone, um, to Help in the Headlines, Critical Evaluation to Combat Fake News in the Media. Uh, we're going to go over just a little bit of housekeeping in advance. This gives some other folks time to join us on the line um, and for you to get a little bit you know, more comfortable with the, the video uh, conferencing software that we're using. Um, so we're using Zoom technology here. Uh, all participants as they join are going to be automatically muted. We really do this to cut down background noise because um, we've all been in that situation before where you're eating Pringles at your desk, you're settled in for the webinar, and here you are um, broadcast on the recording. So you are muted. We will stop uh, several times throughout the presentation and check for questions. So if you do have a question during the presentation, just go ahead and put it in the chat box for us. Um, we'll see that come in and we will read it out for everyone um, so that we can all benefit. So recording, just a heads up that we do record our webinars. Uh, we record these so that we can make them available to other members um, who can access them on our YouTube channel. So just putting in a plug for our YouTube channel. <laughs> if you haven't been there before, we have a wide range of webinars um, and other presentations available to you uh, surrounding the issue of health information or the topic. Um, for those of you who are new to an NNLM webinar, uh, just a heads up, the National Network of Libraries of Medicine is a program of the National Libraries of Medicine. This oh, Liz is getting oh, yeah. comments because our sound is going in and out. Oh, is that so? Let's see if we can just bring this a little bit closer. Let me make sure that's the sound source. Oh, you want that one? This one? Yep. Yeah. All uh, right. They are not lit up. That's our. Oh, I'm so glad someone said something. Okay. Uh, can you guys hear us now in the chat? I see um, a couple people. Better, yes. All right, excellent. Thank oh. you so much for letting us know before we got too far in. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. We just got a new um, microphone here in our, our room, and we're still adjusting to it, but the sound quality should be a lot better than the one that we've used previously. So excellent. Um, where was I? Uh, the program. Yeah. <laughs> so the National Network of Libraries of Medicine program has been around for over 50 years. Um, what this program does is outreach and education on behalf of the National Library of Medicine. And a big part of the education is conducted through webinars like this on various health information topics. We do promote uh, NLM resources and tools, and you'll see some of those in this webinar as well. So let's go ahead and just introduce ourselves. Well, let's see if we can get, there we go. All right, uh, so I am Bobby Newman, and I am the Community Engagement and Outreach Specialist here at the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, Greater Midwest Region, um, which is all a very fancy way of saying I connect with the public libraries in our 10 state area. You can see the 10 states on the wall of the map behind us from North and South Dakota all the way over to Kentucky. Um, yeah, Liz? Uh, my name is Liz Kiskaden. I am also here at the Greater Midwest Region Office for the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, and we're located at the University of Iowa in Iowa City, Iowa, um, which is a lot of Iowa. Uh, if you're ever in the area, feel free to stop by and visit us. We're located in Hardin Library for the Health Sciences um, on the second floor here. All right, we're gonna go ahead and go. I am gonna stop uh, our video so that we won't be distracting you or ourselves. But you should be able to see the PowerPoint. Oops. All right, today we're gonna to talk about health in the headlines, so let's get to it. <laughs> uh, we're gonna be introducing you guys to some health news sources, and then talk about what happens um, between maybe some of the research that's being done and the time you see a headline uh, highlighting that health and how it ends up that way. A little bit about assessing health information in the media, and then share some reliable sources of health information. So this is a pop quiz for you guys. Um, go ahead and type in the chat box maybe, where do you get your news sources or where do you get your health news? And, and or where do you think your patrons are getting their health news? And it's okay to confess that you get it on Facebook. 
Um, <laughs> no judgment here. Just put it out there. <laughs> Let's see where you guys are getting your news. And you can go ahead and just put this information in the chat box and we'll read a few of these out just to kind of give um, our attendees a sense of. Somebody said celebrity doctors. All right. <laughs> CNN, Twitter, Wall Street Journal, JMA, JAMA, Dr. Oz. Oh, I hope those are for your patrons. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, blogs, box. Oh, somebody says that they go to Medline Plus after seeing something on Facebook. Oh my goodness, that's fantastic. You get a prize. For those of you not familiar, Medline Plus is a consumer health resource that's uh, created and maintained by the National Library of Medicine. We'll be sharing a few resources from that later on. Oh, and WebMD uh, is, is, I guess, the other one uh, in there. And some good people said CDC and FDA email alerts. Okay, good. There's such a great blend of stuff in there. It's nice to see uh, you guys are taking advantage of all of your options. So um, I'm sure you guys have all seen this health headline making the rounds. Uh, I have to say I get really excited about this because I will confess I'm not a gym person. Um, <laughs> Me neither. I go, but um, boy, it is a struggle. So I would be much happier if I could just drink half a bottle of wine and call that, you know, three hours at the gym. <laughs> I want to support this. <laughs> um, but that, so uh, this is just an example of one of the health headlines you might be seeing around this time of year. And of course, if red wine is good for you, why wouldn't vodka be better? It stands to reason. Right? Yes, it's clear. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so let's take a little bit of a look at some of these. Um, this one, I think, was making the rounds last year, and I think I've seen things similar to this already this year. And this is a great article, uh, talking. well, a great example, maybe not a great article, talking about some of the health headlines we see. And in this case, uh, this actually ends up being a good example for one reason, and that is because they actually link to their source. And Liz will talk a little bit more about this later. Yeah, I know. A lot of times they're just referring to like a study and um, don't link out to anywhere. So I clicked on the link to the study and I found some interesting information. And I've got some really bad news for you guys. Actually, what they found is that um, when you eat plants, there, there's a microbial product produced that is beneficial during influenza. And the best way to intake the number of plants you need or these flavonoids that you need is uh, eating fruits and vegetables. It's not tea or wine. Oh, that is disappointing. <laughs> and in fact, it's still the recommended that one glass of wine, and that's, oh, I can't see me, but um, it's literally that five ounces. That's, <laughs> not a fishbowl. It's not a fishbowl. It's not, not that glass you pour the whole bottle into. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's some bad news. And here's just some more examples, I think, of the, <laughs> we've got some people in the chat are sad too. <laughs> um, good company. Uh, these are just some other examples of maybe health headlines that we see going around um, on social media or other places. Uh, maybe your, your aunt or uncle who's still forwarding those emails to you or are sending some of these your way. And we'll get more into these, uh, this fart thing with the cancer later. <laughs> So let's talk a bit about some of the popular news sources for health news. Oh, wait, those, I don't, okay. Something is wrong with the- Don't panic, it's good. With the way that this has been, the, the display is working. Um, so one of the things to think about is if you're getting your news from social media is the, to be aware of letting commercial algorithms decide what news you get to see. So sorry, that's you, Facebook and Twitter users, and uh, maybe some of the other apps out of, out, out of there as well. Um, according to a 2016 study by the Pew Research Center, one in, or six in 10 Americans get their news from social media, and Facebook is still the most popular source for that. So, so you can kind of see here what's coming up. And then uh, Liz wanted to make... <laughs> Make a little plug from our the GMR Facebook page here, so you can choose to get your health news from the GMR page. Um, but I just want to remind everybody that Facebook has been working on their algorithms, but I still don't think that those are something you should be relying on to predict the best information. I also say, depending on the size of the news um, uh, outlet, they may or may not have uh, scientific journalists on their staff. So in some cases, larger news outlets might have journalists that are trained to interpret scientific research 
um, and make it easily understandable and report to the public. And, and sometimes they don't. Um, so just be aware of that. I know we included some examples in the images here of things like large media agencies. Washington Post, for example, does employ um, science journalists, uh, as well as magazines, more commercial outlets, um, O Magazine, Cosmo, Glamour. I've, I've seen some strange things come out of those titles. Um, TV and local newspapers oftentimes get their information from major news wires like Associated Press um, and United Press International, <clears throat> which in turn often source their information from press releases. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But for those of us who, who rely on some local news for smaller newspapers, um, oftentimes they're not working with a, a specialized uh, journalist on their team. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about challenges for journalists in our presentation today. Yeah, I think I saw a statistic about the average length of a health news on a local morning show being somewhere less around 30 seconds. So just a little news bite. Yeah, just a little headline clip for you. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of those challenges that journalists face when they're trying to bring you health news. Uh, one of the first ones is that often journalists don't have a background in the science um, that they're trying to explain to us. So we know that there have been changes to journalism across the country and um, often cases those are cutbacks and that kind of thing. And so many organizations that maybe once did employ uh, journalists with a scientific background no longer do so. And they're left struggling to make sense of some of the information that's shared out to them. Um, they're dealing with powerful vested interests. Um, they've sort of taken on this role of trying to explain science to the average person, um, one that maybe they're not prepared to do or maybe shouldn't be doing. Um, they also only have so much time in the day, just like the rest of us. So they have to deal with the, so let's probably type to the next one. They're probably relying on reporting from scientists or public relations, press releases. Um, and so instead of like taking the time it would take to delve down into the research or read the actual article, they just read the press release that was sent out and trust, um, in some case, cases, maybe rightly so, uh, that it was accurate. and. Uh, if they're encouraged by um, media outlets and other stories just to repeat stories that other organizations have shown, especially things related to like health technology. So in fact, um, anything that indicates a positive results can sometimes be, they can be required to share those or feel pressure to share them. And then of course, in the clickbait era, just getting readers attention and having um, something that grabs readers into the site and click on the article and to spend their, their precious time on their media source is a, is a real pressure. This was a really interesting um, example of sort of the flip side of that. So I talked a little bit about uh, journalists just taking what scientists say for granted without challenging it. And this is an article, if you Google it, it was in Post? Yeah, it was in the Post. The Washington Post. Mm -hmm. um, where a, a, a science writer, so someone with a background and the information to understand um, what she was reading and what she'd been seeing, wrote a response or a, an assessment to some information that Dean Ornish had shared. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with his recommendations, let's correct me if I'm wrong here. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm a Dean Ornish fan. So uh, Dean Ornish does, um, promote a very plant-based diet for folks with cardiovascular disease or high cholesterol. So I'll share that high cholesterol runs in my family. I have the Dean Ornish cookbook um, and I've been you know, using a lot of these recipes for creating plant-based meals over the past uh, few years, sometimes better than others. Yeah. You know, comes <laughs> and goes. He definitely has uh, bad fats and, and wants some restrictions for uh, meat, especially I think red meat. And what was really interesting to me about this is so the article uh, published, the author published this article saying that everything he says about it is wrong. And he read it and responded. And then she responded again. So this is a conversation we don't usually see uh, in science writing or in reporting. And what was really interesting for me reading through this is that they, you got to see how two people with, with expertise interpreted the same data. So well, they both were talking about a report in their responses that talked about uh, the increase in the amount of 
protein and uh, bad fats and other things that Americans have been eating. And then both of them sort of interpreted that, that information differently. So um, this is sort of a, a good example of people who know more than me reading the same information and coming to a different conclusion, which is exactly. fascinating. Uh, here's a, <laughs> a nice little comic uh, that we thought we'd share about uh, how science gets translated into the news cycle. Uh, so you can start here at the top. Uh, you can see a little bit of a research is translated by the, the public relations office. Um, yes, most places have one. And then that is released out to the Newswire organizations. And it's usually at that point simplified down to, as you can see, A causes B, says scientists, or the, a new study, which is what we often hear these days, right? Gets out onto the internets, and then eventually um, maybe cable news picks it up, and then your local news source, and then your grandma. <laughs> this is, uh, I like this, it's timely around the holidays. Um, I don't know about everyone else, but we had some, some family gatherings around Thanksgiving, and I heard a lot of really interesting um, reports from health studies from my family members. But as you can see from this uh, comic or illustration, essentially it's just the old fashioned game of telephone, right? Uh, by the time we hear that news information, it is so far uh, disconnected from the actual research that was developed um, at the beginning. Yep. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, things to talk about. How many of you are familiar with this uh, chocolate article? And this, this case, I guess, case study I want to talk about, not really, yeah, but yeah. Case study. Uh, <clears throat> so I've got some really bad news for you guys. Um, if you've seen the, the information out there about how good science or chocolate is for your health, um, there is a study that was conducted, uh, wait, it's not even a study. Let me back up. A journalist <laughs> set up a low quality health study. What he did was take a small group of people, I think only about 16, and then he tested them for a huge pool of uh, different things. And so without going too far into depth, when you do research like that, you're, you're very likely to find one thing to be statistically significant. So the outcome of what he was doing was that chocolate um, was helpful for weight loss, but he could have just as easily found something else like drinking coffee or uh, I, I'm not sure all the variables he controlled for, but I think chocolate's a good choice. That's something I want to believe. Right, people want to believe that, and that's important too. Uh, so what he did was uh, conduct a, a bad study, and then he published, he wrote an article about it, and then he submitted it to some, uh, let's say, questionable news sources or journals, so probably predatory journals where he paid to have uh, his research published, and then he wrote a really nice press release about it and sent that out to news sources, like you saw in the last uh, little cycle. And this was something that basically um, news sources picked up qu quickly and was quickly spread through uh, media outlets, including Modern Healthcare and Huffington Post, Cosmo, et cetera. But it's, an, it's a great example of how easy it is to conduct a bad study and how interested people are in reporting that study. And his, his whole intent really was to prove how easy this was to be done. Exactly, yeah, this, this actually really went viral at the time. It was picked up internationally, in fact. Um, I heard a, a little clip about this on the radio on a health information uh, piece done by John Tesh, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, it's kind of a celebrity um, information guru. So it, at the time, this, this was all over the place. And again, it's something I certainly want to believe. It's a title that is sensational, right? Um, it's shocking, exciting for those of us that like chocolate um, and surprisingly easy to, uh, to get out there. Yeah, I love this. Oops, I didn't, I missed those bullets. <clears throat> Did this change the practice? No. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit about how people search for health information online. We know that eight in 10 Americans or US adults have sought information online, start their search inquiry at a search engine like Bing or Yahoo or Google. And half of those searches are performed on behalf of someone else. Um, so whether they're interested, whether they're a caregiver or looking for health information about someone in their life. And then, a little less than 5% of the searchers actually go ahead and, a lot of them come up against a paywall, but some of them then go ahead and pay for the information behind that paywall. So that's why having good sources like mm -hmm. from my age matter. Um, 
And the other thing that was really interesting about this is that a good 20 to 30 percent of information seekers actually read about the experience of others online. So in this case, they're reading about um, people sharing their experiences, whatever type of website it is, and using that information to make health decisions. And for those of you interested in the study that, that came out of Pew, it's actually incredibly good. It's called the Diagnosis Difference. Um, you can search for that online and get a whole bunch of information from there about searching health information online. And of course we read the news. Um, this is another study. This was undertaken by the AP-NORC, Center for Public Health Affairs Research. <laughs> Um, essentially that basically most Americans report that they just read the headlines. Um, only 41% of Americans report that they actually go beyond the headlines or last longer than that, you know, sound clip at the top of the hour um, to find out what the real news story is. I think there's something else I was going to say at this time. I can't remember what it was. Well, I'll just say that that's uh, my practice as well. I'm embarrassed to say that oftentimes when I read something in the headlines, um, I don't read beyond it, and then I continue to tell people at my local bus stop um, about <laughs> surprising new studies that have come out. So I'd like to share a little bit of information about what, what happens. How do things get lost in translation from scientific language to popular media? Um, many of you hear buzzwords, I think, related to health reporting. For example, remedy, impact, all natural. Um, where do some of these terms come from and how are they uh, translated from the original study? All right, I have another cartoon for you. Why do we hear such conflicting reports from scientists, right? Um, this is a cartoon by Jim Borgman. Um, and of course, it's just kind of random, right? Smoking can cause heart disease in you know, rats, women, you choose. I think one of the biggest challenges we have is that, that media commonly reports research from preliminary studies. Um, you'll often hear a tagline, a new study shows um, in, in common health reporting. So just a little bit of information about what a preliminary study is. Um, reporting from single preliminary studies is actually a problem. A preliminary study is often exploratory. So it's often conducted to test the feasibility and the cost of the study pr prior to conducting a larger one. So for example, instead of recruiting hundreds of adults with a specific um, condition, hey, let's see what we can do with a handful of graduate students on campus and see if we can create something that may be feasible at a, a larger level. So they tend to be small and often they tend to be animal studies. Um, and when we get to our, our our piece on evaluating health information, um, that's one of those important things to look for. Was this a study done on animals alone, um, with rats, for example, or was it done on human beings? And who were those human beings? What we often don't hear about is the next part of the process that should follow, which is the replication of that study to determine if the results are valid. Um, another term for this is reproducibility. That replication or reproducibility is particularly important for sensational findings with large implications. For example, the chocolate study that Bobby had, had showed previously. Another famous example of that is of Andrew Wakefield, whose 1998 publication in The Lancet claimed a link between autism um, and the MMR or measles, mumps, and rubella vaccination in children. A decade following that study, none of the other research teams were able to replicate it, um, but it's already been in the public consciousness. As an, ast an American astronomer claimed, extraordinary claims should be backed by extraordinary evidence. Um, so when you see something like this that is a preliminary study reported in the media, uh, think about how reproducible that is and whether those findings can be generalized. Another uh, element that plays into this is publication bias. Scholarly journals themselves have a bias towards publishing new groundbreaking studies. So again, it's that element of sensationalism. There is very little interest in publishing studies which results are inconclusive or that lacks evidence. There is also not a lot of interest in publishing a lot of replication studies. Um, which is why we see a lot of these smaller preliminary studies being reported. 
researchers at our universities, just like the University of Iowa, where we're, we're home to, are always under pressure to publish. Promotions and tenure are increasingly tied to biblio bibliometrics, or the number of publications that ha they have produced, and how many times those publications have been cited by others. Due to this pressure to publish, um, they focus on what is new or surprising, because that is what's being uh, published in the journals. Add to this the fact that our media also likes to cover uh, unusual, funny, and controversial stories. It kind of um, increases that broadcast. And I want to just illustrate this with another case study. So this is the one related to, to farts, and we had this on an earlier slide. I think this is just a nice example of sensationalized reporting involving a preliminary study and also of that telephone game effect that we presented earlier. So dozens of news outlets released this story. It was all over the place. Yet the scientists involved in the study never made this claim. So where did it come from? So let's track back and see where that came from. Um, in fact, there was a press release from the University of Exeter, which was where this research team was located. And that press release stated that rotten egg gas holds the key to healthcare therapies. That press release actually misinterpreted a quote from the research uh, manuscript itself. Uh, the, the researchers that were working on this study were using a compound that delivered small amounts of hydrogen sulfide to mitochondria to determine if the stressed cells in this petri dish stayed alive. All right, so this is lab testing and it's preliminary. Within the manuscript, they had a quote. Uh, they said, although hydrogen sulfide is well known as a pungent, foul smelling gas in rotten eggs and flatulence, it is a naturally produced in the body and could in fact be a healthcare hero with significant implications for future therapies for a variety of diseases. So they use this as uh, flatulence, as farting, as an example of hydrogen sulfide, and it spun out of control in news outlets. Um, hopefully not a lot of you were out there sniffing farts for health <laughs> benefits um, because that's not gonna get you anywhere, um, except just in some weird, awkward situations. <laughs> so in fact, I will say our own university has had some issues with misinterpreted press releases. Uh, just back in 2016, we released a press release from the University of Iowa about components of some common spices, oregano and thyme, used as a cure for wasting diseases. The release didn't include information that this was an as yet unpublished study involving mice only, and um, that the um, part of the motivation for getting the press release out included some commercial interests from the lead researcher that was looking for um, patents. So this was a, a situation that we ran into locally here as well. So outside of just um, uh, publication bias and pub publishing information on preliminary studies, we do have misinterpretation of common scientific terms. Uh, terms like theory, significance, risk, and evidence. I just wanted to touch on uh, the literal misinterpretation of some scientific terms. And what's funny is every once in a while in our presentation room here, the lights go off and Bobby or I have to stand up and dance around a little bit um, because they are on a, on a timer. So we're getting our fitness too. <laughs> so what about theory? Oftentimes in the general public, we hear the word theory and we equate it with idea or supposition. It's used interchangeably. In fact, in the scientific language, a theory means an explanation for something that evidence, such as facts and data, exist for, or that can be tested by an experiment that somebody could perform. In many cases, there's a quantity of facts available and a theory is an interpretation of those facts. An example of this might be climate change, right? Um, this isn't just a guess, it's a, it's a theory that's based on scientific evidence. The other example I gave is significance. Now, Bobby mentioned this earlier. Uh, are the findings of a study st statistically significant? Within st statistics, there's um, a value known as a probability value. A prob probability value is used 
um, to show that a result is unlikely due to random chance alone. So a finding is statistically significant if there is less than a 5% probability that the finding resulted from chance. And that is what that p-value is that you'll see reported in some of those studies. Risk is another term that's commonly misinterpreted. This image here actually comes from the New York Times and it's part of an advertisement for the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And obviously the purpose of this is to motivate people to go in for colon cancer screenings. But it doesn't give you enough information to really determine what the risk is. Um, risk in a lot of our, our scientific findings is actually determined by a calculation. Let's take something like this. Um, if you saw a billboard when you were driving that said, cervical cancer will strike 80,000 Americans, how do you understand from that really what your risk is? Well, to determine that, you need to know what the population was at risk. So how many people could possibly get cervical cancer, right? Well, that's women. We've got 300 million Americans. If you assume that half of those are female, well, that's how you can get that risk. Um, which comes to 0.5%. So I always ask when you're looking at a term like risk, out of how many? And finally, evidence. Evidence is an important term in scientific language. Um, for myself in my day-to-day, -day, I could say, oh, I see evidence that my dog, you know, ate again, uh, the cookies that I set out. In scientific terms, evidence really is uh, data that comes through numerous rigorous testing. So it's empirical data which supports a scientific theory. I actually saw a really good clip uh, from a frontline video in which Dr. Uh, Seth Moonkin explains what he means when he says that there is no scientific evidence for an intervention. And what he said was, I'm as confident as we can humanly be. I'm as confident as I am that if I were to walk off this building, I would not be able to fly. So we're looking at a pool of strong evidence that comes through rigorous testing. And just a sidebar, I've got an image of buttons on this slide here uh, for a site called askforevidence.org. Now, if you've never been off this website, I encourage you to check it out. It's actually a public campaign to encourage the public like you and me to find evidence behind news stories and marketing claims that we see online. So another topic related to evidence are levels of evidence. So I just wanted to spend a couple minutes introducing this to you as well. Um, the levels of evidence pyramid you see on the left here comes from our own library, but you'll see variations of this available online. Essentially, the intent is to rank the strength of study results by the type of study. Um, loosely, if you were to summarize, there are three main types of research studies. There are observational studies, such as case-controlled studies. These are smaller studies where individuals with a particular condition are selected for comparison with another group. They tend to be small because they, they involve people with uh, serious diseases that cannot or should not be replicated in others. An interventional study is something we're a little bit more familiar with. Interventional studies um, are often randomized controlled trials. Many of you are familiar with these or may have participated in one. So essentially you have a group of individuals which are randomly allocated into either an experimental group or a control group to test uh, an intervention. Uh, generally, or best practice, folks shouldn't know whether they're in the control group or the test group. Um, that's an example of an interventional study. Now at the very top of this pyramid, you see summaries of best quality trials. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit more about how to find some of this. But that top piece is called systematic reviews. What a systematic review attempts to do is to identify, evaluate, and synthesize all of the evidence or all of the studies that meets um, eligibility cr criteria to answer a given research question. So for example, we've been talking about chocolate, right? Well, I wanna know if chocolate is really, uh, offers me any health benefits. In an ideal case, I'd be able to find one of these systematic reviews, one of that uh, type of publication, which will have collected all of the studies out there on chocolate and health outcomes and summarized it for me. And finally, before I pass it over to Bobby again, I just wanted to share this list of, of terms that comes from Health News Review. Um, Health News Review 
has a mission to help the public, again, find evidence about um, what they, they learn about in the news, but it also supports journalists who are reporting on health topics. According to the founder, Gary Schwitzer, these are the seven words that you shouldn't use when, when reporting medical news. And for us on the other end of that, as uh, consumers of news, these are the seven words that should be red flags. If you see something about a cure, a miracle, a breakthrough, promising, um, language is important. Uh, Gary puts these out as a plea for a more disciplined selection of words by healthcare communicators um, in a step to improve everyone's healthcare. Okay, so now we'll talk a little bit about how do you assess the healthcare information or the health information you come across in the headlines or in the media every day. I, uh, I use a statistic in, in one of my other classes that nine out of 10 Americans cannot, don't have the health literacy skills they need to process and understand the health information they come across every day. And that includes news headlines, which is largely what we're talking about in this class, but also uh, new uh, advertising media, you know, those kind of things. So it really is kind of um, alarming when you think about it. There's so a lot, lot of health, there's yeah. a lot of health information out there. And um, yeah, so okay. So the couple things that you can look at when you're trying to assess health news headlines. Um, the first is, if, can you identify the research behind the study? Uh, the example I gave with the drinking tea and wine might help with influenza did link through to the study. Now, granted, it wasn't, it wasn't a good example of actually uh, creating a health headline or a news article, but at least they did link to their source. Um, I know I've seen a lot of articles where it just says a recent study. And right. Mm -hmm. Liz is going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, if the research was done on animals, or not on humans at least, then it can't be extrapolated to humans. And when we're talking about that too, also take into consideration um, what the demographics of that study looked like. So how many people were in the study? The bigger the group, the better. Uh, that chocolate story I shared earlier had 16 people in it. <laughs> um, so that's not very many. And if there's a control group, which is sort of a basic thing for, for scientific research, and then what that control group actually looked like. Was the purpose of the study to assess what the headline actually claims? So, for example, Liz gave the sniffing farts story. That was not the purpose of that study. And often, scientific studies are things that are not, aren't looking for things that are as flashy as the headlines that we often associate with them. So, take a good look at what the study was actually trying to prove. Um, and who paid for the study? It, Who's, who's, who provided funding for the research. And then also take a look at the sources cited in the article. Um, at least one of them should not be connected to that research study in any way, so an independent source. Um, does the reporting talk about the costs associated with the study or with the treatment that may be recommending? It's probably free to sniff farts. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> but not to drink wine. <laughs> um, the other things to consider is, um, is the story presented in a, a bigger context? Does what you're reading sound too good to be true? So uh, like the headlines that about how good chocolate is for you or how great wine is for you, uh, maybe you should be thinking it, you know, this sounds a little too good to be true, it probably is. And the people they, if, if it's a news source, if they're interviewing other people to talk about the study, who are they asking to talk about it? Is that person actually qualified to talk about it? I like to give an example when you're talking about um, the idea that we have to prevent both sides. If you're running a morning show program on providing a nutritional breakfast, you don't invite someone on who thinks the cake is a reasonable option. <laughs> <laughs> it is a great, it's a great treat, but uh, that's not both sides of the story. Okay, so let's look at this next one. So I just wanted to give everyone an example on how you might go about locating the source of that media report. Now there's a fancy term for this, which is sourcing articles. Um, so not that fancy, but now you know, and you can swing that term around. On the left here, I have a report from a media outlet on grunting and how it is helpful for some sports. Now you're gonna see in here, it doesn't say who the authors were, what the title was, or what the journal that it was published in. It does tell me that it's from Texas, um, and I can see from here that it, it involves grunting and athletes, right? 
Um, on the right side of the screen, you'll see a screenshot. So uh, what I did is I went out to PubMed. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with PubMed, um, it's a biomedical index that is created and maintained by the National Library of Medicine. It's freely available. Anyone can go out to PubMed.gov and search for content. Um, in here, I used some of the keywords that I highlighted from the article. I know it's Texas, grunting, athletes, and I was able to locate the actual article. Oftentimes, you don't need to pull up the full text article to, to understand some of this, but you can just look at the abstract, which is the summary that's available here in this screenshot. And from here, you can find out a lot of useful information. So for example, I learned that the sample size for this study was small. Um, the study included only tennis players, not all athletes, and it included an interesting variable that included the overall noise. Um, including shouted encouragement from onlookers. So there were quite a few variables included in this study. Um, I'm not gonna say that it isn't valid because I haven't looked at it in depth, but there are enough things here where I have become a little bit more skeptical. Might be a lot more going on there. <laughs> okay, so when we're talking about assessing health information, we're going to go to my favorite source, which is Medline Plus. Um, there's some great tools built into Medline Plus for you. Under health topics, you'll find understanding medical research. And this asks some of the same questions you saw me talking about was, you know, did the study involve animals or people? Oh, did the study involve people like you, which is something uh, we didn't talk about earlier that you want to make sure that the demographics of the health data or the health information you're looking at reflect the group you're, you're you or whatever group you're trying to look up information um, on. And there's a whole history of that in the healthcare profession um, that it tends to be certain groups of people in medical research. Mm -hmm. Evaluating health information. Um, I think this is a great resource both for library staff and for the public, our patrons. Um, if you're looking for information on the web, it's a great reminder just to look for some basic things. I think most of us have, have heard in the past, for example, is there an about page? What does it say? <laughs> is it a .gov website, et cetera, et cetera. And evaluating health information online. Um, and this is slightly different because it goes more specifically into the online aspect of information and publications. But obviously, we try to point people towards a .gov .gov or .edu or .org email address. And this is another um, great option. This is a video tutorial, and we know that um, some people prefer to get their information that way for a variety of reasons. And it's a video on understanding medical words, um, a tutorial from the National Library of Medicine. Another option I like to suggest is the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. And when I do, uh, yes, the, the, somebody has pointed out that the restrictions on .org and uh, those type of email or um, web addresses have changed. And so yeah, you, .org isn't necessarily as reliable as it used to be as an indicator for reliable information, but it's one of many. Um, this other resource I like to point out is from the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. And this asks some of the similar questions that we've seen before, but it really is focused on uh, complementary and integrative health. And I know sometimes uh, people feel like those all options aren't getting a fair shake um, when they're looking at other health sources. Um, this has some really great uh, checkpoints like we've already seen with the other ones, you know, um, who runs the site or the app? Can you trust them? You know, does it does it do what it's promising? Uh, that kind of thing. But one thing that's really great about this website is when you look at um, the the A to Z index of say health information. If you're, let's say you're going to go look at um, a Canadian line. Oh, dang it! <laughs> <laughs> Whichever. <laughs> Uh, go to look at Echinacea, it will tell you what we actually know, what the research shows about it. And when I demo this in person, one of the things I like to show is not only does it tell you what we know, which, um, bad news guys, it doesn't actually show that it helps you, Echinacea. I don't know about dandelions. Oh, I don't know what wow. that one says. Um, but it also lets you know what happens if you choose to keep taking it, <laughs> if there are harmful side effects, which is kind of nice because I know um, sometimes people choose to keep taking those things. Um, 
but there's there's good resources here for uh, complementary and alternative information. And I will say too, one of the things I like about this is when you look at those records, when you're out at that A to Z list and you're looking at uh, dandelion, ginkgo, what have you, each records will have a bottom line. And you can see that on the screenshot here. What's the bottom line? And the bottom line summarizes what evidence, again, scientific evidence from rigorous studies has been collected. In some cases, it will say there is not enough ev evidence to support using this, um, but studies are ongoing. And in some cases, there will be enough evidence. Yeah. Uh, this was a little tricky. I think we all, um, we all run into personal stories around health every day. Um, and I think that sometimes that's really, even though you know maybe what the scientific evidence is saying, or you know that you should be looking it up on Medline Plus, um, that you, it's compelling. It's compelling, yes, to have a, a heartfelt story uh, with, with um, aspects of it that are pulling on your emotions. So one thing to keep in mind when you're looking at headlines or even talking to someone about health news is to beware personal stories, um, especially when you're looking at the results, say, of some type of, of, of healthcare option. Um, the chances are that you're only hearing from the, the people who had positive outcomes is pretty real. And there's not, a lot of times these don't include long-term results. It's only a short-term response or a short-term results that's being reported out again. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as Liz mentioned earlier, a huge part of the scientific process is being able to test it out again. Um, unfortunately, hey, I, I replicated that test and it was successful isn't um, a very catchy headline, but it is probably one of the most important things that happens in the process. And this cartoon here is just showing you the bias when it comes to sharing anecdotes. So essentially, you're not hearing oftentimes from those who are not around anymore to share their story. So I'm going to share a few other reliable sources of health information and tools that you can take with you um, following this webinar. Now, one of those things I shared earlier was the value of systematic reviews, which are results and a publication type that's ranked very high in levels of evidence. Um, we used to have a wonderful resource that we shared as a part of this class called PubMed Health. Now, unfortunately, PubMed Health was retired at the end of October. So instead of using that, I'm going to show you how to locate systematic reviews within PubMed. I am going to open this up now. Let's all cross our fingers. There we go. So here you are in PubMed, and again, for those of you who have never used this before, um, PubMed is freely available. It's a National Library of Medicine resource. I'm going to just make this a little bit bigger for myself. Now, one of the topics we talked about earlier was chocolate. I'm a big fan myself, um, and I also mentioned that I have high cholesterol in my family. So let's see if we have anything related to chocolate. And I'll just put cardiovascular. I'm excited. I am too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hold your breath, folks. Um, what this is, is just a basic keyword search, right? I'm looking for any uh, citation that can, contains these two terms. Now, I'll share that PubMed currently has over 28 million citations in the database. These are generally from biomedical journals, but PubMed does index some full text books as well. Now here I am, I'm looking at all the results. And remember what we're looking for are those high level of evidence, those systematic reviews. Over here on the left, you're gonna see an article types column. Now you'll, what you'll wanna do is click customize and you're gonna see this full list of article types. Down on this list, it's alphabetical. You're gonna see systematic reviews. You can click that box and select show. Now you may be wondering at this step why nothing happened. What we did is it actually just added this to the article types column. Now when we click on it, it's going to go ahead and summarize. There we go. We're going to be looking at just those systematic review publications and you'll see that there are 26. And look at this first heading, chocolate consumption and risk of cardiovascular diseases. So this is a meta-analysis, which is closely related to a systematic review. In fact, they go further and they actually summarize the statistical data together as well. So perhaps there is hope. I have not looked at this in advance. So look at chocolate consumption may be associated with reduced risk 
oh, of cardiovascular disease. So it looks like I need to be uh, eating about 100 grams a week. I'll have to take a look at the next chocolate bar I go to. Um, but this is an easy way to pull those high levels of evidence, those systematic review publication types. Oops, I'm gonna really just try to close this. There we go. All right, a couple of other resources I wanted to share. One of these includes a book that's freely available. It's called Know Your, Your Chances. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. It's available in print as well, but you can access the full text in PubMed on the online bookshelf. This is a great book. It's intended to better understand health information by teaching you about the numbers behind the messages, the medical statistics on which the claims are based. Um, I like this resource because it talks a lot about risk and outcome. Within this book, there are risk charts that are designed to put your own health risk into perspective with a number of different um, conditions. So my favorite books on this topic help you to develop a healthy skepticism, which brings me to my next title, which is Smart Health Choices. This book is intended to help folks like you and I and practitioners to develop skills to assess health advice and to make decisions that improve the quality of care. Um, somewhere on the, in the description of the books, it includes some information about dealing with the conflicting flood of health information that deluges us every day through the media. And in fact, they have a lot of content about that in this book. This is also freely available through PubMed in the online bookshelf. Um, it deals with some of those scientific concepts we, we discussed earlier. What is evidence? How do you assess it? What is probability? Um, and how do I see through some of the noise, some of that um, sensational news in the headlines? Finally, I wanted to put in a plug for Health News Review. I mentioned Gary Schwitzer before. He is at the University of Minnesota, and he's the founder of Health News Review. This is a fantastic resource. Their mission is to improve the public dialogue about healthcare by helping the public critically analyze, analyze claims about healthcare interventions. Um, if you look at their blog today, you're gonna see a few new health news stories. They take these health news stories from the media and actually critically analyze them for you. Um, just this week, there is one posted called, USA Today provides rosy speculation about Alzheimer's vaccine not yet tested in humans. And another one, Newsweek, Trump is an aggressive new cancer drug, but where's the data? So this is a great place to go uh, to familiar, familiarize yourself with the process of critical analysis. They also include some great toolkits. In fact, there's a toolkit for um, the public, for you and me to analyze studies. There's a podcast series. And I say the editorial team for this resource is amazing. Um, they, it includes clinicians and scientific columnists at larger media centers like Washington Post. Um, Gary himself has over 43 years in uh, radio, television, multimedia, and the internet. And in fact, he will be presenting a webinar coming up right next week. So I will be hosting that. Gary will be our guest. Um, that is scheduled for next week, Thursday at one o'clock central time. You can go ahead and register that for that at any time. It's part of our kernel of knowledge expert speaker series. Hey Liz, uh, in yep. the chat somebody is stating that this website will not have daily content after the end of this year. Do you want to address that, that? Yep, that is correct. So I did talk to Gary about this in fact earlier today. Um, there will be some limited funding available so the, the resource will be maintained. You will not see as many posts as you have in the past. So this has been funded through uh, grants previously. The current grant is going to be running out at the end of the year here, um, but it sounds like Gary has found some limited funding to maintain it on an ongoing basis. So it's still gonna be out there, you're just not gonna see as much uh, activity on it. Good. Got about five minutes left, so that's worked out pretty well. So what next? Uh, I see some of you in the chat, our names I recognize, uh, either as colleagues here at NNLM or people we've worked with in the past, but if you're new to the National Network of libraries of medicine, um, please consider joining the network. I know it says libraries of medicine, but the network really is for everyone. Uh, it is organizational, not, not individual. So you wanna see if your library or your organization is a member. And when you do that, you can apply for funding for health and wellness information programs and outreach. And we'll also provide complimentary printouts and posters for your library patrons. 
such as this um, lovely one that we partnered with the American Library Association on. So we, we partnered with them to make, gosh, now I think there's 15 maybe. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of because um, statements. Because statements with the Libraries Transform campaign and, and we have nice 11 by 17 versions of those. Mm -hmm. yeah. Take them home, put them in your office, put them in your library, put them in your dorm room. Hang them in the back window of your car. Whatever you need yeah. to do. <laughs> Uh, you can also keep up with us by following us on Twitter. If you're a tweeter, I do my best to maintain our account. And if you're a Facebook uh, user, you can that's like. Me. That's yeah. That's everybody. <laughs> you can follow us on Facebook. Um, we do post health news information there, but also uh, more educational opportunities. So we have four minutes for questions. If anybody has any questions, and I'll go ahead and open up our chat box here. Okay. Make that a little bit easier. There we go. Somebody has that because they can use right. Yeah, that's go. great. Right outside. Good for office. you, Betsy. I love that one. Oh, and Heidi recommended a podcast called Two Docs Talk. I've never heard of that before, Heidi, and I will follow up and check that out. And Becca, I too am bummed that Health News Review is going to be reducing. Um, kind of their activity. I know for a while they were accepting donations, um, but I spoke to Gary this morning and it sounds like he's found some funding uh, from the foundation at the University of Minnesota to sustain it. So they've kind of backed away from that. All right, well we, hey Carolyn, I love orange too. <laughs> I still use my, I still use my cookbook. Oh, thanks, yes. All right, well, Bobby and I will just hang around for a few more minutes, but those of you who have places to go and um, things to do, go ahead and sign off. We will be putting this recording up on the YouTube channel. It usually takes us about a week or so to get everything closed captioned and you'll see it online then. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel. Select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.